Richard III, one of the most notorious and controversial figures in English history. For over 500 years, his body was lost. Then, in August 2012, a group of archaeologists and historians went looking for it in a car park in Leicester. And on the very first day, in the first trench, they found him. No. No. The news made headlines around the world. King Richard III was found buried under a parking lot. The earthly remains of the last of the Plantagenet kings. Yeah, the the Scientists have confirmed that a skeleton found under a Leicester car park is that of King Richard III. It is one of those things that no one in their right mind would ever have predicted happening. Um, it is, even now, unbelievable. The chances of finding Richard was a, I don't know, a million to one. The bones revealed that he really did have a twisted spine, as Shakespeare had claimed. A horse! A horse! My kingdom for a horse! But identifying Richard was just the start of the story. That curvature is major curvature. I mean, yes. that, that's seriously something going on. During the last year, a second phase of investigation has been underway. This time, the scientists are asking, what was the man with this body capable of? Channel 4 has had exclusive access to their research and in this program reveals their results. Detailed reconstruction of Richard's diet and drinking. The diseases he suffered. It's extremely unusual for us to be able to apply this level of analysis to human remains in archaeology. And another extraordinary stroke of luck. He's virtually identical. Yes. The discovery of a living, breathing body double who has helped to rewrite Richard's incredible story. These are the bones of a King of England. Scientists and historians have never had a chance like the one they offer. The discovery of Richard's body is utterly extraordinary. The fact that you actually have a king's bones which you can study gives all sorts of opportunities which no one had quite appreciated beforehand. The man on this table seized the throne in 1483. Just two years later, at the tender age of 32, he was killed at Bosworth Field the last English king to die in battle. Ever since Richard's death, his reputation has been hotly disputed. Richard III is frequently painted as the character who murdered his nephews, the princes in the tower. I can smile and murder whilst I smile. In the 20th century especially, people have looked again at Richard's character and not seen the embodiment of evil. They've seen something far different, a man who was struggling against adversity and actually could be a bit of a hero. There's one great mystery in the historical accounts. They mock him as a weak and feeble man. But they also praise him. The histories are very interesting because even those written by his enemies very soon after make great play of the fact that he died manfully, he fought well, and died in the thickest press of his enemies. The Leicester find and the scoliosis that bent his spine call Richard's fighting prowess into question. Could a man with such a twisted back really wear armour? ride a war horse and lead an army into battle. Some people who have written books about Richard uh, have anticipated that he might have sustained significant back pain, or he might have had a limp or not functioned so well on the battlefield, for example. Now the scientists are attempting to solve this mystery by discovering Richard's true physical condition at the Battle of Bosworth. Laying out Richard's spine only allows a rough assessment of its shape. So the first task 
is to measure just how badly bent it was. Experts at Loughborough University create exact copies of each vertebra. Then, radiologist Bruno Morgan rebuilds the entire spinal column in three dimensions. The reconstruction reveals that scoliosis had bent Richard's spine up to a staggering 80 degrees. And it also reveals another important new discovery. These joints look completely normal, nice, flat, smooth, uh, facet joints. But as we move up to his thoracic spine, we can see that the anatomy has been disordered. And this is the degenerative osteoarthritis that Richard would have had from his scoliosis. And because of this, there can be only one way these facet joints fit together. They fit together a bit like a jigsaw. This chronic arthritis could have caused Richard constant pain. I think to suffer from arthritis in the Middle Ages would have been more painful uh, than today. The kind of uh, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs that we take for granted now simply wouldn't have been available. So far, the findings are at odds with the historical accounts of his fighting prowess. If Richard's disability had affected him, it's difficult to uh, imagine that he would have been there uh, fighting in the thick of it. But the bones can only reveal so much. To work out how Richard would have moved and fought requires a living person who shares his spinal condition. So perhaps putting someone through their paces wearing armour on horseback would give us a much better idea of whether a scoliosis impeded your ability to do that. The chances of finding a perfect body double are remote. It's extraordinarily rare to find anyone who has the kind, exact kind of scoliosis to the same degree as Richard III, because the vast majority of people who have it in that way uh, have surgery to correct it. The vast majority, but not everyone. Meet Dominic Smee, a 27-year-old unemployed IT teacher He's come forward and offered to help. His curiosity was first aroused when he heard about the discovery on TV. I was kind of thinking, OK, this is, this is quite weird because there are a lot of similarities between me and him and I thought, I wonder if something, if something's going on here, this is a bit strange. Dominic started searching and came across an online lecture exploring how Richard fought in armour. What did it really look like? What did he actually wear? He thought he was looking at his own back. What made the similarity even more bizarre was that Dominic spends most weekends as a reenactor at the battlefield site where Richard was killed. and his mother has written a book about the king. The actual point where it was revealed on the television that Richard had scoliosis, it was quite a mind-blowing thing, really. I remember thinking, wow, you know, that's, that's almost exactly the same as Dominic, and it was quite, quite eerie, really, to see that. But is Dominic's backbone really a match for the extreme curve in Richard's spine? The only way to find out is to conduct a medical examination with scoliosis expert Piers Mitchell. Um, we can see on Dominic how this part of the chest is much more prominent than this part, and this seems to dip in, and that's because of the position of the ribs. And the reason that happens is the spine twists in a scoliosis. It's not just a sideways bending. And that's shown really nicely here on uh, Richard's scoliosis, because you can see instead of the spinous processes being in the midline, they point right inwards like this. And it shows that there's this twist, so the ribs would have come out this way, and the ribs on this side would have gone inwards just in the same way that we see on Dominic. We should print the ribs out. And if we had the ribs, I think it would show He's virtually identical. Yeah, he's... 
For 500 years, people have speculated wildly about Richard's appearance. In Dominic, we now have the answer. As lab work continues on the bones, the team will collaborate with Dominic on a series of experiments to establish whether Richard could have worn a full suit of armor, led a cavalry charge, and fought in hand-to-hand -hand combat. For everybody at Bosworth, or any medieval battle, it was a matter of how long your strength can keep you up so you can wield your pole axe or sword. So it was terrifying, furious, uh, a matter where there was very little control, very little judgment, apart from a furious struggle to stay alive. If uh, Dominic can do this, then I'm sure Richard would have managed to do it because they have very similar scoliosis. Meanwhile, analysis of Richard's bones is about to yield more secrets. Richard III was a key protagonist in one of the most important wars in British history. War of the Roses is the great conflict between the dynasties of Lancaster and York about who really had the right to rule England. It was a matter of might is right. Whoever was the strongest basically put forward their claim to the throne. From a young age, Richard trained for battle. All successful medieval kings of England were warrior kings. There's no exception to that. If they weren't successful in battle, they could not be successful kings. But already the scientific evidence suggests that Richard was suffering from arthritis as he entered the fray. In the hunt for further clues, the scientists turned to a new forensic technique. Dr. Angela Lamb is an expert at the British Geological Survey. And the methods she uses have helped crack high-profile murder cases. Now she's analysing Richard's bone chemistry for details about his diet and health. Your body processes the, the food you eat um, and the water you drink. And they have chemical signatures um, in terms of their isotope uh, composition, which um, gets preserved in your teeth and bone. Analysis of a rib bone, for example, can tell you about the last three years of the life of somebody because there's this constant regeneration of, of bone matter. Whereas other limbs, like a femur, can only really, analysis of that can only really tell you about the last 15 years of a person's life because the regeneration is much slower. Angela starts by measuring the chemical signature in Richard's femur. The nitrogen isotopes showing an increase in the amount of meat and protein they were eating and also increasing the amount of fish they were eating. And Richards are at the top end of, of comparable medieval um, high status individuals. So he, he did have a, a very high status diet. The way you actually consume food is laid down by law. Edward III in the 14th century laid down the laws as to how much you could eat according to your status. But for the rich, then they really have no limit on how much they consume. They can have as many dishes over the course of the day as they want. They can be as rich as they want. The chemistry of Richard's femur shows that for a man of royal blood, his diet was normal for most of his adult life. But Richard's ribs indicate that three years before he died, there was a dramatic change. We do see a large difference in nitrogen isotopes and oxygen isotopes between those two bones, which suggests that there may be some large and significant dietary change from the time he was um, actually king and the period before. Angela and her colleagues are trying to find out why. Meanwhile, work with the team's body double is opening another unique window into Richard's physiology. Dominic Smee is being analysed by physiotherapist Claire Small. Good. OK, same again. You're going to stand on one leg. You're going to take the arm out. You're going to take it back as far as you can. And then 
She's an expert on spinal pathologies and has worked with Paralympians. Right, OK, now come and stand, come back to the middle, come and stand up. This test reveals how scoliosis affected Richard's mobility and fitness. Well, I'm really impressed with his range of motion. In fact, he's got better range of motion than a lot of other guys his age. Good. But while Dominic is flexible, on the treadmill test, there is the first indication of a physical problem. And jump off. Oh, enough. I'll leave it. Just yeah, okay. I'm starting to feel breathing. Yeah. It's getting a bit tight. Okay. It's uh, my chest tightens up, so it's more difficult to breathe, breathe out quickly, to compensate for the amount of oxygen I need to keep running faster. His ribs won't expand and contract because of the, the rotation of his ribs associated with the scoliosis. So that means his lungs aren't going to be, he's not going to have the lung capacity that would allow him to take in maximum doses of oxygen. The thing that is going to defeat him is fatigue. And obviously, if you're thinking about someone in battle, that's the sort of thing that you can't afford is, is to get tired because that then makes you vulnerable to attack by your enemy. Dominic's scoliosis restricts his breathing and makes him tire quickly. <laughs> Something that could have proved fatal for Richard on the medieval battlefield. Next, the team want to test whether Dominic's body is up to the brutal art of medieval combat. This experiment is being supervised by Dr. Toby Capwell, curator of arms and armour at the Wallace Collection. Toby has scoured rare medieval texts to recreate this lost art. This is, this is the kind of equipment that you need to start becoming very well acquainted with. You imagine, imagine a medieval battle. There are thousands of people waving sharp weapons around in a big pile. You can't really get anywhere near that kind of environment, let alone thrive in it, unless you're wearing pretty substantial equipment. What I've noticed is it's, it's, it's very short, sharp bursts, but a high amount of energy that's expended in that short amount of time. So it makes you wonder what it would have been like to have to keep going for the, the full time of a battle. It's very technical. And a small, a small more uh, lightly built person just has to be faster and they've got to be better at those techniques. They train to take on bigger people. Medieval combat expert Dave Rawlings is trying to establish whether Dominic has the range of motion needed to use a medieval longsword. So from here, like so, is actually exactly the same thing. So you see we're training a very similar group of muscles and the same thing. Generally speaking, he seems to be quite capable of doing everything that's thrown at him, which I'm finding really exciting. Now continue that circle and cut up from underneath. Good. Hands up. Good. How's that motion for you? Is that all right? Pull of sword. And it will be interesting to see how the difference of having the weight of the armour on and uh, using a weapon, uh, seeing what happens then. That was fine. Through from your side. The next challenge is to solve a question that was first posed by the dig team when they found Richard's body. Can medieval armour really be made to fit a man with Richard's degree of scoliosis? That curvature is major curvature. I mean, yeah, how do you get armour on that? The evidence from Richard's own lifetime is inconclusive. I mean, the portrait of Richard in armour in the Rousse role is a stylized one. 
if you look all the way through the Roos roll, virtually every male is wearing armour, and Richard actually is displayed beside his son, um, who died, and he is also wearing armour. So whether this is a real portrayal, it, it's very doubtful. The only way to know for sure is to try and encase Dominic in armour. But this experiment raises new challenges. There's no English armour surviving from the 15th century. From all of the thousands of armours that were produced and worn during the Wars of the Roses, nothing that can be said to be the work of an English craftsman survives. So Toby Capwell has brought Dominic to Sweden to work with world-renowned armourer Per Lilleland. Oh, wow. Dominic, hey, nice Per. To meet you. I'm very pleased to meet per you. Dominic. He's going to see if he can create a fully functional suit of medieval armour to fit Dominic's torso. The turned edge and, and this one here is, is really beautiful. We're now wrestling with the same issues that Richard's armor would have had to deal with in the 15th century. I was going to show you this one here. Mm -hmm. That's a depiction of Richard as well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be a, quite a long process before we finished um, to get it all to, to work. While Pear gets to work, Dave Rawlings continues to test Dominic's physical capabilities. I'm going to hit your own head. Make sure you're going to block it. Good. It's clear that Richard had to be super fit to cope with the rigours of medieval combat. Ready. Block it. A fact not helped by the way scoliosis can restrict breathing. And back in the lab, the scientists are finding evidence that Richard's health might have been further compromised. Scoliosis expert Piers Mitchell also studies ancient diseases. And he's discovered that Richard had something nasty in his gut. Some parasites humans have had right throughout our human evolution. And roundworm is one of those. It's spread by the contamination of your hands uh, with human feces. Although people at the top end of society were far cleaner than those at the bottom end and they did wash their hands regularly, they too were susceptible to diseases because the people preparing their food might not wash their hands or, or they might prepare food straight after going to the loo or any number of unsanitary causes might have got the diseases into the food and into the king's clothes and therefore he too would have been affected just as the rest of society. Do we need to clip on? So you can see on the screen, this is one of uh, the parasite eggs from Richard III sacral soil. It's a roundworm egg. It's oval in shape. There was little Richard could do about this potentially debilitating condition. The symptoms of roundworm include asthma-like uh, symptoms, uh, nausea and vomiting, but also diarrhoea. So to have had roundworm and to have exhibited those symptoms in the late Middle Ages would have been very unpleasant. compelling evidence of Richard's ill health is stacking up. So far, the team studying Richard III has discovered that he had severe arthritis and roundworms. And there was a mysterious change in his diet just before his death. Experiments with body double Dominic Smee have also established a problem with his stamina. And soon Dominic will be tested to the limit in a full suit of armour. Fighting in armour is really tough at the best of times. Even if you're really fit, if you're fully able, wearing 40, 50, 80 pounds of armour in some cases, wielding a sword is going to be very difficult. You're not going to be able to do it for very long. Establish this line here over this one here. So this one will be this more or less the same. As Per constructs the armor, a new worry emerges about how to fit it to Dominic's torso. 
The majority of the armor's weight should rest on the waist, but Dominic doesn't have one. Dominic doesn't have any space between his lower rib and his uh, his hip bone is like uh, less than an inch. Yeah, it's perfect. Cannot have any uh, waistline of the armor going in here. It would be extremely painful for him for in a very short time. So we actually have to carry most of the weight of the armor on his shoulders. This would have further stressed Richard's already weakened back. Is this one almost perfect? Yeah. See? Yeah. It's but, seated perfect. But the right one is... To solve the problem, Purr tries to brace Dominic's back against the armor. And turn towards you. The result is figure-hugging and flexible but looks clearly asymmetrical in its unfinished state. His scoliosis is obvious, just looking at this plate. But once you see it on him, and you realize that it's gonna be partially covered by the lower back plate, a lot of it's gonna be covered by the shoulder defenses, I actually think when Dominic's fully armored, you won't be able to tell there's anything unusual about his form at all. Richard III would undoubtedly have tried to hide the girl from the spine. The way a king looked was enormously important. When a king was ill, he would never reveal what was wrong with him. You couldn't be seen to have that sort of weakness as a king. I'm kind of imagining what Richard would have looked like in his armour, because, I mean, his armour would have had to be very similar to this to accommodate that body shape. While Purr builds the new pieces, it's time to start the next phase of the experiment. The cavalry charge in medieval warfare is this centuries-old method of just sweeping everything before you. Now that was the tactic on which Richard hoped to be victorious at Bosworth. When everything else failed, you charged straight towards the enemy commander and hoped to kill him. Writing shortly after his death, the historian Polydor Virgil suggested that Richard was an expert horseman. He spurred his horse. In the first charge, Richard killed several men and made a path for himself through the press of steel. It's very hard, actually, um, trying to get the position right. So many things going on in your brain and the horse's brain. There's only one way to find out if someone with a spinal curve of up to 80 degrees can really ride a medieval war horse. So, welcome to our stables. Dominic, meet Dominic. Good morning, Dominic. Hi. How are you? Dominic Sewell is one of the world's top medieval riding instructors. Well, I hope to have told you a little about a bit what, we, uh, what we do here. At first, Dominic tries a modern saddle. One, two, three, go. Well, nicely done, well done. Just looking at Dominic now, you can imagine Richard as a child receiving riding instruction in the Earl of Warwick's household. He would have gone through a one-to-one -one training experience just like this. And try and push him out a little bit. But Dominic's back is causing problems. Good. Don't over lean, stay in the middle of the saddle. That's good. I'm, I'm slouching, because, uh, rather than I've got to focus on keeping my shoulders back. That's it, shoulders back, weight down, feel the body. I've got to concentrate to do it because I, I naturally want to do that, so I've got to work on keeping up right position. Sit up, sit up, look ahead. Good, good. And in three, two, one, and... Because my centre of gravity is on the side, because of where the curve is, most of my weight's on that side. So I think that the horse is probably going to naturally feel like I'm telling it to go to that side. If Dominic struggles with a modern saddle, how will he cope with the hard wooden saddle that Richard used? Now, this is the medieval saddle. This is what you're going to be riding in from now on. This is your arming platform. Yeah, it's your 
your gun mount if you wish. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be interesting in between the legs because it's like, um, it looks a bit like a, a, a log that you're effectively sitting on with a tiny bit of padding on, but it's, uh, I think I'll notice the difference. Good mount, well done. Okay, let's walk into the reader. Can hold on. It's a slow start, but then something happens that confounds all expectations. Good stuff. Keep going. Keep going, Dominic. This is good. This is really good. Okay, and relax. Whoa. Right. I am flabbergasted by just how much that saddle helps you. I'm not bouncing all over You're not bouncing. Place. You have more control. I'm very encouraged that the medieval saddle um, is actually helping you. Well done. Excellent. Excellent start. Does your back feel more supported, Dominic? Yes, because it's, because it's, it's, it's in one place. So remember to turn and hold. Turn the shoulder and hold. First thing, let's get that horse moving. Right, so. Focus is power. Here we go. Support, leg on, and off we go. This is only Dominic's fifth riding lesson. <laughs> well done, Dom. Good job you hit it, because if you hadn't, you'd have hit it with your face, which would have been bad. Yeah, that was good. Couch, couch. It seems that the paraphernalia of medieval warfare doesn't hinder a person with scoliosis. It actually helps them. But what about the armour? Per Lilleland's work is complete. Right. Here's your wow. acolyte. Ready for war. The curve in Dominic's spine is now barely visible. I think he looks pretty darn good, actually. Do you feel that the back plate is there and you could actually rest yourself against it a bit if you yeah, wanted to? Yeah, it keeps me in, in a kind of a position not while I'm rested but before I'm rested so while yeah. it's just the natural yeah. positions it stops me slumping so yeah. that's why I'm really interested to see what happens when I'm riding to see whether I can still do that. How's that doing? Okay walk. How secure are you feeling at the moment? Whoa. Actually, a lot more secure. You're feeling more secure than you were without the armour? Yeah, because you, you kind of kept more stationary. Okay. And break. So far, Dominic has accomplished each individual task that's been thrown at him. But soon, he'll be tested to see whether Richard could combine all of them on the battlefield at Bosworth. Ah, put the leg forward. Left foot forward. Keep it there. Meanwhile, the lab scientists are further analysing Richard's bones. And they're beginning to make sense of the mysterious change that they discovered in Richard's diet just before he died. The first clue lies in the historical record. The menu from Richard's coronation banquet has survived over 500 years. And it's a catalogue of medieval excess. You've got a huge diversity of meats especially, and it's meat that marked out high status diet in particularly more than anything else, more than cereals, more than vegetables, more than fruit. So just an example of some of the things he was eating. Sturgeon, quails, rabbits, egrets, venison, carp and bream, partridge, roe deer, peacocks in his hackle and trapper. Now it's nothing to do with taste. By all accounts, peacock was hard to digest, it was chewy, it wasn't good, good to eat at all. But these were a delicacy. They weren't a delicacy because of their taste necessarily, but they were a delicacy just because they were so difficult to obtain. An opulent banquet to celebrate Richard's coronation is no surprise. But the chemical analysis of Richard's skeleton shows that he didn't stop there. The nitrogen and the oxygen isotopes both 
shift quite considerably. So from that, we can decipher that it, it had to be something that has a high nitrogen isotope value, but was more terrestrial in nature. So we're talking about uh, animals such as pigs, possibly wildfowl, freshwater fish, and most of those were real delicacies in the late medieval period. Richard's food consumption went off the scale. His diet when he was king was sort of way beyond that of a, uh, an even an equivalent high status individual in the late medieval period. Greed ran in the family, proving an irresistible urge for Richard's predecessor, his brother, Edward IV. It's interesting to note that Edward IV was reputed as a, as, as, as a glutton uh, throughout Europe by the time of his death, and there were uh, indications that Edward's prowess, his ability on the battlefield, had been compromised by his love of food. And it's really interesting to think that Richard II had access to this incredibly sumptuous, incredibly lavish royal diet. The evidence suggests that when Richard III took to the battlefield in 1485, his body was in no shape for fighting. As Dominic Smee's final test approaches, the team are about to find out if Richard's scoliosis compounded the problem. It's a big pressure. It is a big pressure, and uh, no one is more aware of that than myself. Uh, and yes, I'm concerned. Desperately concerned, uh, if I'm quite honest with you. And Richard's bones have one more secret to reveal. Richard III's last stand took place in a field nearly 15 miles from Leicester. The Battle of Bosworth, quite simply, is a battle for the throne of England. Richard, the defending uh, king, is there to defeat the claimant to the throne, Henry de Tudor, and the winner of the battle will be king of England. The future of Richard's reign and the destiny of the entire nation came to rest on one decision. The critical moment in the Battle of Bosworth was the charge by Richard towards Henry. On horseback, with his men around him, he went to Henry trying to kill him, and he almost got there. Richard and his knights charged a distance of around 1,000 metres. Richard's choice, then, to try and win the battle by cavalry may have been affected by his physical condition his scoliosis and the ability of the saddle and the armour to support him uh, while in battle. So far, Dominic Smee has proved Richard capable of performing the individual skills of a medieval warrior. But could he put them all together in battle? For his final test, Dominic will first attempt Richard's famed cavalry charge. Galloping 1,000 metres on a medieval war horse in full armour to strike two sets of targets. Ahead, uh, in the distance, is where Richard's enemy, Henry Tudor, is. And that's quite a distance to go in uh, all this kit, but this is what they're all trained to do. This is everything you want. You've got your armour, you've got your horse, and that's your kingdom. So you're going to go and fight for your kingdom, you're going to win it, you're going to be the best you can, yeah? How does it feel in the armour? Do you feel empowered wearing the armour or anything? You feel like a juggernaut. Charge! Dominic has passed the initial part of the test. Yeah, it struck that quintain really well. And I think for him to use that axe the way he did, his speed was fantastic. I think really the proud of the young man. 
think that we let him yell charge helped a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, his mojo went through the roof after Absolutely. that. Absolutely. But if the charge was achievable, what went wrong for Richard III at Bosworth? It's certainly possible that Richard's downfall was coming off his horse. On his horse, in his armour, he would have been supported, protected. He would have been seen, most importantly of all, he would have been seen still to be alive, still wearing the crown which everybody says he wore at Bosworth. So therefore he was in charge, in control and able to lead. As soon as he was off his horse, he was going to tire very quickly, he was not going to be seen, he was not going to be able to defend himself. Yep. Yep. Good. Okay. Dominic's second test is hand-to-hand -hand combat in 30 kilos of armour. This test shows that Richard could have moved and fought well. But his stiff rib cage would have caused him to tire more quickly than other soldiers. Had any king been dis dismounted and forced to fight on a foot, he would have had a problem. Against a larger army and a more confident army closing in on him, no king really would have had much of a chance. But in Richard's case, he was especially vulnerable. A horse! A horse! My kingdom for a horse! Richard's enemies cut him down inflicting an array of injuries that cover his skeleton. But the surviving bones have yielded one last clue. A fascinating detail that raises further questions over his fitness at Bosworth. The oxygen isotopes in Richard's ribs suggest that in the last three years of his life, he started drinking around a bottle of wine a day. An increase in wine consumption would explain why he, he may have had a, a higher isotope, oxygen isotope value at that time. In our estimations, it's, it's about sort of 25% of his oxygen intake. It was a considerable step up from what was his average drinking before. You know, he was banqueting a lot more. There was a lot of wine um, indicated at those banquets. And tying all those together, it looks like that that had quite an impact on his, his diet in the last few years of his life. When it comes to liquids, the, the, the great dividing line is status. Rich people drink wine as much as they can through the day. Huge amounts of wine were consumed by the, the, the wealthy. Some wealthy people also drank beer. They didn't drink water. If Richard wasn't drinking water, then he was consuming a total of two to three litres of alcohol every day. But I doubt whether his fitness levels were perhaps quite as good as they were before he was uh, crowned king. Richard III's death marked the end of the Wars of the Roses. Richard III is often said to be the last medieval king of England, and in one particular way he certainly is, because he's the last king of England to have died on the battlefield. After Richard's time, kings were far more cautious than to put themselves right at the front of the army. They stood further back and eventually they left the battlefield altogether. The kings that followed no longer attempted to combine the conflicting customs of fighting and feasting. The evidence suggests that it was ultimately the heavy burden of kingship that defeated Richard. Not his scoliosis. It makes me feel a lot better about myself, knowing that I can do something that ordinary healthy people struggle with and yet I've managed to do it despite having this condition. When you actually see you coming over, you can't tell your size, you can't tell how slender you are, how slight. You just look like this facade of a tank coming forward. It's made me realise that my back wasn't, wasn't holding me back as much as I thought it was. I thought that it was, I can't do these things because of my back, it's getting in the way, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that, and listen to all these people saying, no, 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 don't do that, you'll be at risk from this. And really it was actually my own level of, of fitness that was holding me back, and, and it is completely possible to do these things. 
Dominic has laid to rest the myth that Richard was a weak and feeble man. Instead, we have discovered that he was dissolute, but not disabled. A hard drinker and a big eater, but a skilled fighter. He could have led a heavy cavalry charge and fought in brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. He emerges as Britain's last true warrior king. And the story continues on More 4 with more on England's warrior king and how scientists sifted the clues in Richard III, the unseen story. But next up here on Channel 4, bringing suspense to the subway, Denzel Washington and John Travolta in the taking of Pelham 123.